15, verse 17 through 20. St. Luke 15, 17 through 20. And we'll be reading from the New King James Version. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. If you would, draw me in the title, The Making of a Good Father. After the choir sings, The Making of a Good Father. Lord, I know you've been so good. Lord, I know you've been so good.
another hand clap. God, I know you've been so good to me. I pray that there's not one saint in this house that can't say, Lord, I know you've been good to me. You've been my mother and you've been my father. Come on, somebody. Could have been dead sleeping in my grave, but Lord, you made death behave. Hallelujah, somebody. This is serious business. Yes, yes. Praising God and loving him, warning him and seeking him. It's all about him now. All about him now. It's all about him, church. It's not about you and me anymore. We've had our chance. Now it's about him. Lord, you've been so good. Not because I've been so good, God, but because you've been so good. Uh, Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. Another opportunity to preach your holy word. The word, oh God, that will change and challenge and convict and correct. The word that will heal and deliver and save. Father, thank you for entrusting me with this word this morning. And I ask, oh God, that you will hide me behind the cross. That they will see none of me but all of you. To you belong all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. And Father, when it's all over, we will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The making of a good father. The making of a good father. The making of a good father. I did not say a perfect father. I said a good father. Notice that one of the responsibilities of John the Baptist was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And if ever there was a time that this needed to happen, it's now. To my brothers and to my brother deacons and trustees and all who are here with us today, good fathers are in short supply. And I know that we talk about the hand that rocks the cradle, the hand that controls the world when we're talking about mothers. But I'd like to suggest to you today that the reason this world and the reason this nation and the reason the universal church is in the condition it is is because good fathers are hard to find. On this Juneteenth day, let's be real. We have fathers who don't have their hearts turned to their children. Fathers who have never put their arms around their child and told them that they love them. Fathers who have never shown their emotions in front of their children. What I mean is many children have never seen their fathers cry. Fathers who have never taken their children to church or sent them to Sunday school and didn't go with them. Fathers who have walked out on the family Fathers who have never led their children in prayer or never prayed for them and with them. Fathers who have time for everything in the world but never have time for their children. But on this Father's Day, I'm so glad to say to New Providence Baptist Church dads and, and other dads online, we, we appreciate you. And all that you do. And because of that, I'm going to ask all the dads to please stand. And granddads, please stand. Yes, we applaud you. <laughs> Amen. You know what? We can do better than that. Let's applaud our men. If we don't do it, who will? Amen. 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 Oh, yes. We applaud you and we thank you. Many sermons zero in on the prodigal son and his wayward ways. But today, let's look at the father. 
Jesus used this parable to show us what that Father God is really like. Our text begins with a certain man blessed with two sons. And as we look at the story, let's consider the star of the parable, the good father. And this story speaks more of the father's relationship with his sons than anything else. And notice the honesty and the openness of their relationship. You can hear it in their communications, if you will. Each member of the family knows they are appreciated and valued. Relationship building can be challenging. But fathers, we must never underestimate the value of a good relationship. So this certain man of our text was indeed a blessed man. A man likes to have a son, right? You know, daughters are beautiful and desirable, but a son keeps the family name intact. And normally a daughter assumes the last name of her husband while a son keeps the family history traceable and intact. So this man had two loving, supportive, and caring sons. And we are not told what caused a younger son to want to leave home. His mother is not mentioned. But what we are told reveals several things about the father and their family relationship. The younger son was confident that he was free to talk to his father about anything. Come on, church. Look at this. The boy became excited about the prospect of striking out on his own. He wanted to travel, to see the world, and experience it for himself. He thought about it so much until, uh, 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 until any place seemed better than where he was. And probably knowing, uh, Deacon Mormon, that the older brother would inherit two-thirds of the father's good, he felt that leaving home was the best alternative for him. So most folk listening today may have come to that same place. Needed to leave the small town, move to the big city, get a fresh start, take your chances someplace else. Well, Much have been made of how disrespectful this young man's request was, but I really do not see any disrespect or malice in his request. Well, You're like, Mary Hager, really? I, what I see are several valuable things about the value of their relationship and the character of the father. What does Jesus want us to know about the Father? First of all, the Father was available. It said a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to the Father, Father, give me a portion of the goods that fall to me. See, this father and son had a wonderful relationship that the son felt comfortable meeting with his father on this sensitive issue. The father was available, understanding and responsive. The sinners and publicans were afraid of God. The scribes and the Pharisees were trying to measure up to God. But Jesus presents a God who is willing to meet us where we are. So maybe this is a good example to fathers today. Yes, you are the breadwinners. Yes, you are the protectors and, and you are the head. And maybe our sons also need you to be available. Thank God for his availability. And then this good father was generous. He divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered his stuff together, took his journey to a far country. So the father is generous and liberal without being controlling. I hope somebody's listening. Amen. See, I know the father probably would have desired better choices being made by his son. But he sees that his son has made up his mind. His son may not have learned all the lessons he will need, but the father sees some growth in him. At least he's ready to leave on his own. You see, brothers and sisters, normally, sin makes a person selfish. They think only of themselves. They don't just want their portion. They want all they can get. Am I right? This son requested only the portion that belonged to him. Some folks spend a lifetime trying to get what belongs to others. They're never satisfied with what they have. When we go to God, we're asking, God, will you give me this? Instead of, Lord, thank you for what I have. He gathered all his provisions to leave his father's house. And this was totally a new concept. That God, who has all power and authority, would allow us free will. Are you with me? We are free to make choices. 
And after a few days, the boy took his journey to a far country. Soon he had wasted all his living and came to want. Want and waste are twin brothers. He who wastes will soon come to want. Can I say that again? Yeah. He who wastes will soon come to want. The boy spent freely without consideration of our limits. He was extravagant and he lived extravagantly. The father was generous knowing the son might make a bad choice. See, he knew, just like God knows, that we will make a bad choice. So the good father <clears throat> had influence. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. So what am I saying? <clears throat> I am saying that fathers are always influential in the lives of their children. The good father would have a positive influence in their children. And even though the younger son was away from home, his father's training and influence is still guiding him. Well, Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Some folk allow want and hunger to make them desperate. And desperate folk do desperate things. But this young man, this young man somehow held on to his father's teaching. And even though he's broke, busted, and disgusted, look what he does not do. He does not result to robbery, larceny, or stealing, or cheating. Can, can you get this? Are you putting it together, fathers? He does not consider panhandling or begging. What does he do? He finds good company. And many down and out folk spend their time with other down and out folk. But this young man didn't. Proverbs remind us, if the blind lead the blind, they will both fall in a ditch. He finds a citizen, a property owner, who would give him a job. Do you see what I'm saying? He didn't go out killing the elders, committing violence in the street. But he found a place that he could get a job. Somebody say, get a job. And today, some folk would rather beg, borrow, and steal or anything other than to work. Our young people have no job ethics. They walk around with bleeds, and I'm not putting them down, but I'm just saying. But they don't want a job. They don't want to work in McDonald's or Burger King's. And then they get mad at the others who are working there. So, so fathers, we got to have an influence. You got to have an influence in your sons and your daughters' lives that they can remember to get a job. He remembered the instructions of his father. He got a job. And so the, the father's influence caused him to get a job in the pig pen, in want and hunger. He was tempted to eat with the swine. The father influence had caused him to develop a line in his life. He would not cross. He was not raised to dine with the pigs. Are you with me? The father's influence caused him to remember who he was and to whom he belonged. The father's influence caused him to take responsibility for his actions and to make some needed decisions. We have seen that a good father was available. He was generous. He was influential. And now see the good father as forgiven. The good father was forgiven. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. But then he said, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a far way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran to him and fell on his neck and kicked him. When the young man came to himself, he got out of the pig pen and returned home with repentance. He didn't go back with a, with a big ego. He came back repenting. Why? Because his father had taught him about repentance. Are you with me, fathers? He is met by a father who was always available, always generous, always having an influence. And now forgiving and compassionate. And so at this point, Jesus puts a spin on the story. You see, the old Jewish parable said, the father folded his arms, turned his back, ordered the son to be driven off, because that was exactly what he deserved. But Jesus shows us what a good father is really like. 
to father, his father, saw him a way off. There was never a moment when the father was not longing for his son to return. Some of us, when you're out, you're out. Don't come back here. Pack your clothes and leave. He recognized him. He had compassion on him. And he ran to the son. He fell on his neck and kissed him. Every movement was an act of love totally uncustomary and out of the ordinary. In matters of salvation, rules and regulations don't count. So the elder runs to the younger. The savior runs toward the sinner. The father's love and forgiveness unfolds at every moment. Number one, the kiss means that fellowship has been restored. The ring means the position of authority is restored. The robe means his father has him covered. Shoes means he's not a servant, but a son. And the party means he's back in fellowship. Not only with his family, but also the community. He experiences the full measure of his father's mercy and grace. So now we've seen a wonderful picture of what God is like. But there are some of you today who need a different word from this parable. You aren't the way but son. Instead, you feel the pain of the father. Some of you are parents and grandparents who have prodigals in your family. Your son or daughter may be distant from you because of rebellion or disagreement or sinful lifestyle or bad relationship. Or they may have just walked out of your life. Whatever the reason, mothers and fathers, you feel the pain of being out of fellowship with a child or grandchild. If you are in that condition, I have a word of comfort for you today. And I'll take my seat. To parents or prodigals, First of all, God understands your pain. Sometimes you want to sing that old song that says, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. But that's not true. Because God knows. And he cares. He's a suffering father in this parable. Number two, don't jump in the pig pen to rescue them. You can't get in the pig pen with them. Am I right about that? Yeah, in this parable, the father didn't go to the pig pen and try to pull his son out. That would have been tragic. The son had to realize his own mistake. You can't save your children. God used a pig pen to bring them to that realization. And some of you have kids in the pig pen right now and you want to run and rescue them. Oh my God. They must come to their own point of total desperation to seek God for themselves. And then number three, let them know the door is open. Don't go to the pig pen, but never t- slam the door and tell your child they are never welcome back into your home. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I hope you hear me. Let them know you will leave the light on for them. Come on, somebody. Whenever they're ready to repent. Oh, yes. And number four, receive them when they repent. Don't give them a lesson. Don't remind them of what they did. Receive them. Jesus didn't do that to us. True fellowship can never be restored until your prodigal child has repented. They may return, but if they don't repent, your problem is not solved. It's only aggravated. So parents of prodigals, don't give up. Understand that since we are saved by grace, the truth of the matter is you don't deserve to be. You were dead. You were so far from God. You could not have contributed anything to him. You could do nothing for him. You were dead. You couldn't find him. You couldn't come to him without him drawing you. You were dead, but by grace and by that love, God looked down through time and said, I see my friend needs me. And because I love him, even though he is dead, even though he can't love me back, in spite of all the mess he or she is in, even though I, they, they act like they can't hear my voice, I still love them. God still loves us. He said, I love them so much that I know what I'll do. I'll send my son to die for them because I love them. Not because they are so good. Come on, somebody. Not because they deserve it, but because I love them. And so I get ready to close. Baby, it's not about you, but it's all about a love thing. It's about Jesus Christ who died for us. It's a thing that caused him to be beat all night long. 
tied to a post with his hands above his head. Scourge with a flagellum, the metal and bone sticking in his head, in his back, ripping the flesh from him. It was a love thing that caused him to carry the cross up Golgotha's hill. It was a love thing that caused him to deny the drink mixed with wine. It was a love thing that caused him to cry, my father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Tina Turner once sang a song, what's love got to do with it? But baby, it's all about love. I'll tell you what love has got to do with it. I'm reminded of a song that we used to sing. I was deep thinking, deep in sin, far from a peace for sure, very deeply Stay within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despair cry. From the waters lifted me, now safer am I. It was love that lifted me. God's love lifted me. When nothing else could help, God's love lifted me. God's love, God's love lifted me. It was his love that lifted you and I out of the pig pen. It was his love that came and kissed us and welcomed us back home. It was his love that didn't leave us in the pig pen. But he waited and he waited and he waited and he hung there on the cross, did not come down because we were still in a pig pen. But he stayed cross until one Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hand and said here I am here I am come to me all you that are labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you receive my rest the making of a good father